So it's John 10, reading from verse 22 through to the end of the chapter in verse 42. Let us hear God's word. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple, in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, Believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Again they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again, across the Jordan, to the place where John had been baptising at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign. But everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. I'll keep John 10 open before you as we explore it together today. I'm going to pray for us. Lord our God, as we come before you this day, open your word to our hearts and our minds. May my words be clear and true and speak only the truth that you have given us this day. And we pray that we would take it to heart, that we would go away from this place, meditating upon it, thinking upon it, and being transformed by it. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as you may well be aware, John has written his gospel with a purpose. And that purpose is found in John chapter 20. In verses 30 and 31. And he says there, Jesus did many other things, many other signs, I should say, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the whole purpose of John's Gospel. Many signs were done. (coughs) They've been written down so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose for John's Gospel. And what we've read is that purpose lived out In the life of Jesus. We can see it so clearly lived out in the life of Jesus. In the lead up to 
this section of chapter 10 of John's Gospel. We've been with Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and we explored everything that happened there. There was a blind man whom Jesus healed. He was blind from birth. He was brought before the Pharisees and then, and then kicked out. And then Jesus gives this wonderful uh, declaration about how he is the good shepherd. And we followed that through uh, from chapter 10 down to verse 21 uh, in, the, in, recent, in re recent times. But now we've jumped forward in time a bit. Uh, verse 22 tells us that we're now at the Feast of Dedication, which took place in Jerusalem. At this feast, we see the clearest declaration by Jesus about who he is. That he is the Christ, that he is the Son of God. And the big question that's left hanging out in the open is, what are you going to do with Jesus if he is the Christ? If he is the Son of God, how are you going to respond to him? Because we see two very different reactions to Jesus. There are those who want to stone him and arrest him. And then there are those, as we read at the end of verse uh, at the end of the chapter, verses 40 to 42, who believe in him. So which camp do you belong in? Because there are only two options. Well, this is our outline for understanding John 10, verses 22 to 42. We are asking and getting the answer to these questions. Is Jesus the Christ? Is Jesus God? And even as we ask these questions, another one comes back at us. Well, given what we know about Jesus after the revelation of who he is, are you part of God's people? And that's really the big question, isn't it? So first, the question uh, is found in the text, verse 24. Uh, the Jews come to Jesus as he's walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon and they ask him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Are you the Christ? It's a very clear question. Now, I, I, would, I say to you that there's, there's, there's no accident that this is happening during the feast of dedication and perhaps you're going, oh yes, I remember the Feast of Dedication. It's written about in Leviticus. Well, you'd be wrong. It's not written about in Leviticus at all. This is a relatively new feast uh, amongst the Jewish people. It, it celebrates the time when uh, Judas Maccabeus overthrew uh, a, a tyrannical rule by a man called Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And, and Antiochus Epiphanes IV had uh, put idols in the temple and slaughtered pigs to worship these idols in the temple in an affront to the Jewish culture. Well, this uh, person, Judas Maccabeus, overthrew the ruler, the rule of Antiochus Epiphanes IV, and Jerusalem was recaptured uh, through his work, and the temple was rededicated at this time. It was cleansed and rededicated. So here we are now celebrating the work of what J uh, God did through Judas Maccabeus. The rededication of the temple. It's a celebration of that time. The feast of dedication. It's come to us now and it's known to us even today still as Hanukkah. That's where Hanukkah comes from. Uh, and, and this is where Jesus is. This is the time where he's talking about it. Now, uh, you can imagine that when jo Judas Maccabeus rose up and he was leading uh, God's people in a revolt against these rulers who were oppressing them, you can understand people thinking, oh, here is Judas Maccabeus, he's the Christ. And certainly there were some who thought that way. But the peace that Ju Judas Maccabeus had won for the Jewish people fell apart quite quickly quickly and so did any thought that he was the messiah so we come to the days of jesus and hope springs eternal we're at the feast of dedication are you the christ are you the one who's going to lead us in revolt against this 
Roman uh, uh, rulers who have taken over our lives. What does Jesus say in response? Well, he says, first, I have told you and you do not believe. Now, you might be flipping through John and, and going through, well, hang on, where, where did Jesus say it clearly and plainly, I am the Messiah, I am the Christ, follow me? Well, you won't find it in the book of John. Uh, if he had told them as explicitly as that, uh, these Jews would have misunderstood him. They would have uh, pegged him as a Judas Maccabeus Mark II. They would have thought, here is, here is the next warrior king. Here is the one who's going to lead us in revolt against the Roman rulers. He's going to overthrow them. He's going to take back Israel. He's going to reunite the kingdom. And he's going to be our mighty warrior king with a victory that would last over the Romans. Oh, that's not what Jesus means. In fact, he tells them what he means. He says, the works I do in my father's name bear witness about me. Well, Jesus has, has told them their problem. You're, you're looking for someone who's going to do these mighty works of, of, of revolt, of, of uprising, of, of war. He's like, That's not what I've come to do. Look at the works that I've done. Look at the things that I've done. And that includes his miracles. It includes his teachings. It's not just his miracles. It's his teachings as well. And he's saying to them, look at it. What do they say? What do they reveal to you about what I have done? The blind see, the lame walk. What does that tell you about who I am? What does that tell you about my role as Christ? Do I have power? Do I have authority? Listen to the teaching. The Jews could acknowledge his works. Oh, they certainly saw the blind man who, who was uh, blind from birth who could see. Uh, they, they met him. They spoke with him. They know who he is. They saw the paralyzed man walking. They know him too. And they've heard the words of Jesus and come to the conclusion no one teaches like this man for he teaches with authority. All the work and all the teaching of Jesus is the first indicator that he is the Christ. But the second indicator that he is the Christ is there in verses uh, 3, no, sorry, verses 27 through to verse 30. I am the Christ... I have a people. See, when, when, when this word Christ or Messiah is spoken of, it brings up images of a king like King David. Uh, what does a king need in order to rule effectively? Well, he needs a people. He, need, he needs to have authority and power. And Jesus has shown he has authority and power. But he also needs a people. Who will listen to him? Who will follow him? And Jesus says, I have a people. That's what he says. He says, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. My father gave them to me. Jesus has a people. He has authority and power and he has a people who he will lead and whom he will rule over. These Jews were looking for mighty warrior king. But what they've got is a mighty king. Yes, he's going to overthrow his people's enemies, but those enemies are not the Roman Empire. Those enemies are the enemies of sin and Satan and death. And Jesus says, I have authority even over death because I can give my people eternal life and they will never perish. So Jesus is showing him that he is king, that God has given him a people 
who hear his voice, who follow him. He, he knows his people and he knows them deeply, well, intimately. And he loves them and he cares for them. But even more than that, he will protect them. No one can take them away from him. Did you see that? My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And no one can take them from the Father. These, these statements of Jesus, they're so important, they're so precious. These promises that he's given to his people. This is, this is something every follower should, should know and hold on to and remember. Because they are so good. So good. The Father has given to, his, to Jesus a gift a people who will hear him and follow him and they will have eternal life. And they will never lose their position or their place in that eternal life. It is given, it is guaranteed. It is secured. There are some Christians out there who think along the lines of, well, I hope I have enough faith to get to, get to the end of my life. I hope I've got enough faith for the next 20, 30 years, whatever it may be. I hope I don't run out of steam before then. That's the wrong way of thinking about your place as one of God's people. Because if you're one of God's people, if you've been given as a gift to Jesus, then your place as one of his people is guaranteed. It can't be lost. It doesn't depend on you. It is God who has loved you. It is God who has given you to his son. On the other hand, there are some people, and maybe even some of them, who call themselves Christian, who think, oh, how lucky is God to have me as one of his believers? How lucky is Jesus to have me following him? Or maybe they're not followers of Jesus yet, and they think, well, how lucky would Jesus be to have me following him? Well, that's the wrong way to think about it, isn't it? All those who listened to Jesus, who followed Jesus, were given to Jesus as a gift to Jesus by the Father. We are not a gift. We, we ourselves are not the ones who give ourselves to Jesus. The Father gives us to Jesus. Well, Jesus closes his response to this question about being Christ in verse 30, saying, I and the Father are one. Now, I don't want to stretch this statement too far beyond what Jesus meant to say in the context of what he said here, because it may not be an all-encompassing theological statement declaring that Jesus and the Father are one in being, as the creeds put it. Uh, although that is a true statement, I think here in the context of what Jesus is saying is that he and the father of one mind and one will in relation to the people that the father has given to Jesus. They are secure. They will have eternal life. and They cannot be taken from him. Now, me and my father of one mind regarding the people that God has given me. So what's the answer then uh, that Jesus brings uh, to this question when they ask him, are you the Christ? Well, Jesus says, look at the works that I have done in my father's name. Look at how the father has created for me a people. Look how they hear me. Look how they follow me. Look how I give them eternal life. Look how I protect them and ensure that nobody, no matter how big their army, can take them from me. Look at how the Father and I are of one mind concerning my people. Is Jesus the Christ? Well, the Father seems to think so. 
and of a far higher quality than what the Jews were expecting, with an eternal reign that cannot be overturned. Is Jesus the Christ? The answer is yes. And if there was any about if there's any doubt about what the Jews understood by Jesus' use of the term Father when he says, I and the Father are one, have a look at what happens in verse 31. What do the Jews do? They pick up stones to stone him. They understood what he was saying. And the reason that they picked up these stones to stone him is that they say in verse 33, you being a man, make yourself God. Well, let's ask that question then. Is Jesus God? When the Jews first pick up these stones, Jesus forestalls them in verse 32 by asking them the question, hang on, I've shown you many good works from the Father, but which of them are you going to stone me? It seems that these Jews are confused. On one hand, they say, we want you to tell us whether you are the Christ. Are you the Christ? Are you the one who is like David, close to God, a friend of God, the way David was? On the other hand, don't you dare make yourself God. So they're very confused. And Jesus says to them, well, I've shown you many good works. Think back through them. Is there anything that I've done amongst you that could have come from any other source than God himself? Just think back upon it. Who else could multiply many loaves of bread to feed a multitude of people? Who else could tell a paralyzed man to get up and walk? Who else could open the eyes of a blind man who was blind from birth? Think back through it. These are the many good works from my father which I have done. For which of them? Will you stone me? They have to be from God. I remember being on a train once, crowded peak hour train, coming home from work, managed to get a seat. And there was another guy about the same age as me, he sat down beside me and he started talking to me. And he's telling me all about how some preacher has been going around places in Africa, healing people, making limbs grow back. Opening up the ears of the deaf and making eyes to see. And I thought, hang on a second. There was no evidence of this. It was just anecdotal. And I thought, well, and I don't doubt the power of God to do these things, but it is the power of God that does these things. And he did it through Jesus. And we haven't seen it happen again for over 2,000 years. Not in the same magnitude. Why? Because no one has the power of Jesus. He's the unique son of God, showed in his works and through his power. Yes, through, through, through the apostles in the early church, some of these things happened. But in whose name did they happen? It was in the name of Jesus. It was the power of the Spirit working in them, through them, to point them to Jesus as the son of God. There was nothing in Jesus' public ministry, that even these Jews could point to and say, Ah, uh, we've got you, Jesus. We know that you haven't always done good works because do you remember that time when you knocked down the old lady and stole her purse? They can't point to anything like that in the life of Jesus. Any time where he's done something that was against the will of God. They can't point to anything. And we see that in his trial. Before them, as he comes to, and we'll be exploring this later on this week, won't we? We will see that there was nothing they could pin on him that was deserving of death. And then Jesus goes to calm them down. He says, well, hang on a second. Didn't the scripture call you sons of God? And he draws their attention to Psalm 82. And he says there, and we're going to look at it, he says, uh, Where are we? 
Jesus said to them, verse 34, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? And that's a direct quote from Psalm 82. And Jesus goes on to say, If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Now in the context of, of Psalm 82, this is a psalm directed at the judges and rulers of Israel. And they were judging and ruling uh, uh, with partiality. They weren't doing it well. But Jesus, uh, but in Psalm 82, it says of them, or well, they are called sons of the Most High. And these people to whom Jesus is speaking, they are now the rulers and the judges of the people. And Jesus is saying, well, this psalm even applies to you. Sons of the Most High. This is what Scripture says of you, says Jesus. Now, if that's true of you back then and even for you now, what would you say of someone who was sent by the Father and consecrated by the Father? What would you say about him? Surely he must be the Son of God. And that language, by the way, of being consecrated and sent is very deliberate. Because remember, we're at the Feast of Dedication when the temple was reconsecrated. Well, here I am, says Jesus, in fulfillment of what this feast is all about. I am now the consecrated one. You don't come through the temple to the Father anymore. You come through me. I am the one who has been sent. I am the consecrated one. And he then gives the Jews a litmus test. He says, look, if you don't believe me... And what I tell you, look at the works that I have done. What do they say about me? Believe the works that you may understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Now these, these Jews are put in a difficult place, aren't they? When I was in the early years of high school, I was uh, hopelessly inept at doing my homework. I just didn't want to do it um, most of the time. Or I'd forget about it. And I'd endlessly be getting in trouble for it. So I'd start lying about it. I've left my homework at home. What was a favourite of mine? Another one was, I'll look, I've locked my keys in my locker and I can't get to it. It's in there. I've done it. But I just can't get to it. Well, on one occasion, my English teacher, who happened to be the year level coordinator, called my bluff. And she went to her office. She came back with the bolt cutters. She snapped off the lock on my locker, and lo and behold, there was my homework completed and ready to be handed in. The one time I'd actually done it! <laughs> but this is the problem the Jews are facing with Jesus. I am the Son of God. Well, we don't like blasphemy. God has told us that it's, it's not right to blaspheme his name. And so they're very zealous about that. But what if it's true? What if it's true? What if on this one occasion, this one man, this is the truth? And that's the problem they face. Well, Jesus' response is, look at what I've done. Measure what I've said. If it looks like that these are the works and the words of God, then be careful before you go throwing blasphemy charges at me. And in all, in all of this, Jesus says, well, what does Jesus say the Father says about him? Well, he called you leaders and judges, sons of the Most High. I am the Son of God. That's what the Father has done for me. And look at the works. Are they not the works of God? And Jesus says that his connection with the Father goes beyond what any mere connection could ever have hope to go. Believe the works that you may know that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. 
Know that there is unity between me and the Father. This is not blasphemy. This is the evidence that I am of the Father. That he is with me, in me, and I am in him. We are of one mind and one will, as we have said before. It's a, it's a unity that, that goes beyond what any human can experience. And it explains why Jesus is doing what he's doing. There's a difference in these persons, but there's no difference in their will, no difference in their work. Now Jesus answered this question of whether or not he is God with, look at what the Father has done. He has sent me, he has consecrated me, he has given me works to do, and he dwells in me. Is Jesus God unequivocally? Yes, he is the Christ. He is God himself. That's what Jesus says. Well, if that's true, what do we do with Jesus? There's some people today who want to say that it really doesn't matter what we believe about God or Jesus. And it doesn't matter whether we're Buddhists or Hindus or Muslims or, some, or, or have some kind of New Age spiritualism. Uh, or even if we don't believe in anything at all, all roads lead to the same end. And what's really important is that we don't, we don't force our views on anyone else because we're all right. There are some people who think that way. Well, Jesus says here that's not true. In fact, what we find here is that there are only two options. You either believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and you are one of his people given to him by the Father, or do you, you do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and therefore you are not one of his people. That's what Jesus said to these Jews, isn't it, right at the very beginning. Jesus said to them, I told you, you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. You don't believe because you're not one of my sheep. You haven't been given to me by the Father. You are not part of my people. Only those who have been given to Jesus by the Father have the promise of everlasting life. Only those who are given to Jesus by the Father have the promise of never being snatched away from him. These Jews that have been answering Jesus are of those who have said, we don't want you. They pick up stones to stone him. They try and arrest him. We don't want you. And therefore they are not part of Jesus' people. And I think, <laughs> I wonder if there's someone who has this mindset of all roads lead to the one place. If Jesus were to stand amongst them in all his glory and was to say to them, I am the Son of God, I am the Christ, see me, hear me, hear my words, everything in the Bible about me is true, whether they would still find some excuse to refuse him and reject him. Well, I hope that's not us. I hope there's no one here who would reject Jesus' claims that he is the Christ, that he is God. And well, certainly that is the case for some people. Look at uh, verses 40 to 42 when Jesus gets over to the other side of the Jordan where John the Baptist had been baptizing. Many came to Jesus and they said, John did no sign, but everything John said about this man was true and many believed in him there. Well, maybe that ought to be us. And what did John the Baptist say? Well, in John 1, 34, John the Baptist said, I have seen and bore witness that this is the Son of God. In John 3, 28, he said, I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. In verse 31 of John 3, John the Baptist said, He whom God has sent utters the words of God. And coupled with all the works that Jesus has done, these people on the other side of the Jordan believed in Jesus there. They knew him as the Christ. They knew him as the Son of God. What makes the difference? Well, if we to understand what Jesus said, it is that the Father has given them to Jesus. And it's shown when they listen to him and they follow him and they believe him. And therefore they will receive everlasting life and security because they are held firm by the Father and the Son. Well, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Do you believe that? 
then you are one of his people. And praise God for it. You are a gift of the Father to him. Now hear his voice. Follow him. Listen to him. And pray that you would do so more and more because your eternal life is secured and cannot be taken away. And praise God for his love and his care and his protection more and more because you are forever held in his hand and you cannot be snatched away. Cannot be snatched away. That is the promise of Jesus. But I'm going to pray for us. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us, that it reveals to us that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, and that you have given by your grace us into his hand so that we might believe who he is and that we might have the promise of eternal life secured for us and that we might be... uh, uh, ever held in your hand, never to be taken away. And so now work in us to help us to hear Jesus more clearly, to obey him, to follow him, to honour him, to live for him, that others too may come to know and see Jesus even as we have. Oh Lord our God, we thank you and praise you that you have done this work in us through your spirit, And we pray that you would help us to grow in the understanding and the work that you have for us to do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, We're going to sing once more. This time we're singing from 579 in Rejoice. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he has made known. 579. Jesus.
as we close out our time together. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain and be with you all. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.